She was screaming, I have to go back. He said, I chose you to be my mom again. She can remember descending the staircase, looking down at the man, and he's waiting for her. He just matter-of-factly turned to me and said, Mommy, my brother died in the Army. How he knows even about death at the time, it was scary. He would just start screaming, and he would not stop. I couldn't believe my own daughter had accused me of kidnapping her. Is there something going on that I don't know about? I felt helpless. It was distressing that she was so adamant about this place. He might be having a past life memory. Indianapolis is a big city. There's a good mixture of people around. It's a big melting pot. We have the Children's Museum. We have a lot of parks around. It's a good place to raise a family. I'm originally from Senegal, West Africa. I came here after I retired from the army, just come for a better life. When I was pregnant with Elaji, he was my firstborn, but he was my second pregnancy. When he made it to term, I was relieved, and we got to take him home the next day. I named Elaji after a good friend of mine. El Haji is an Islamic name. It's a title for the pilgrim after they come from the Mecca. More often than not, I would find him just in his own little world. He called out his name. He would not respond at all. When Elaji was in the zone, nothing could pull him out of it. If I tried to get him to focus, he would just have a fit. He would just start screaming at the top of his lungs, and he would not stop. I just figured that he was thinking about little boy stuff, because what could possibly be in his little world other than cartoons and games? LRG was born with knowledge. He was born different than other kids. Elijah can do calculations in his head that most people need a calculator for. At the end of his last school year came a multiplication paper, and the teacher just wanted to know what their skill level is. And so I couldn't help him at all, really. I explained what multiplication was. He got the concept pretty quick. He totally did that whole worksheet in like less than a minute, he just whizzed through it. I didn't help him at all, and I was like, wow. How did he do that? So I asked him, I said, how, do you, how did you do that so fast? And he said, I used to work on the old computers. I was like, what are you talking about? I thought, well, maybe he did work on an old IBM computer in school or something. So I asked his teacher, that she said, no, we don't have any computers like that. So I had him describe it, and he said that they were tan, and they were huge computers. They were big. That's all I could get out of them. I just didn't know what to think. Elhaji is very attracted to military objects, toys, themes. Elhaji would build things out of tinker toys and blocks, but he particularly liked to build guns and machine guns and pretend like they're machine guns and make machine gun noises. We're not a gun family at all. We don't own a gun. So I didn't know where it was coming from. He started talking a lot about his brother and I attributed it to the fact that he was talking about his half brother that was still at that time living in Senegal. The time I have a son, he was still back in Africa. That's what I was thinking he was talking about. I would show pictures to Elaji about his brother. Yeah, you do have a brother. We would look at the pictures, but he would talk about some other brother. I'm like, what other brother? He told me that his brother was 19 years old. His brother in Senegal at that time was 11 or 12. One time, Elaji and I were playing, 
And he just matter of factly turned to me and said, Mommy, my brother died in the army. This brother was shot. That is when I realized that he must not be talking about his half brother. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Central Georgia is in the heart of the Bible Belt and is quite religious. Centerville is a small town in the center of Georgia. It has a small town charm to it. Most people know each other and they're quite friendly. My name is Medley and I am a stay-at-home mom. Riley was born on March 12th, 1996. After a pretty normal pregnancy, I had a difficult delivery with Riley. During delivery, Riley's head was fused. The bones were fused so they didn't lap over. When they're fused together, it's hard for her to come down the birth canal. It was a painful delivery. After I gave birth, I was incapable of doing anything for a long time. I still have problems to this day. Riley was born with gray hair, which was really surprising to all of us. The doctors could not explain it at the age of six months. Riley's hair began to change color. That was a relief that she had color to her hair. My name is Kimberly. I've known Riley since she was two years old. I'm a friend of the family. Riley had a tendency to act older than what she really was. She was very articulate. Her speech patterns were more of an adult as opposed to a, a child her age. When we went to like the grocery store, at school, anywhere, she could start talking to people in these full conversations and they'd be shocked at such a small child talking to them. Riley was the type of child that you never knew what she was gonna do next or say next. And then what happened confused me. When the movie Titanic came out, Riley was around three years of age, and her stepsisters were discussing the movie. Riley seemed to know a lot about the Titanic. Riley had begun telling them about what had occurred. She was not talking about the movie stars of the day. She was talking about the real Titanic. She was talking about people coming back to the docks and people looking to find out if their family's names were on the roster of the dead. It was shocking that she knew any of this. Riley had never seen the movie Titanic. I don't even believe to this day she's seen Titanic. She was always advanced for her age, but one of the most shocking moments occurred when she was three. Riley's stepsister took her outside to see a full moon, and Riley began singing a song, and I've never heard this song before. It's never been on our television. I asked at school, and no one could recall this song. I see the moon, the moon sees me. Please, Mr. Moon, don't you tell on me. The song had an air of age to it, like it came from another time period. Hey, hey. Trying to locate the song. For several years, I looked, and I could not find it. Hey. And then my son Noah found the song. The song was from the early 30s. The name was Please Mr. Moon Don't Tell On Me by Hartman's Heartbreakers. I knew this was the song because I could remember the tune. But then when we heard the rest of it, I was in shock. But it feels so good. The song has a lot of sexual innuendo. It was shocking. Part of the lyrics in the song say, I want a daddy, I want it bad. And those type of lyrics are not something you're gonna hear in Ring Around the Rosies. It's not something a three-year-old would be exposed to at the time. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. I wanted to put it away and just forget this was occurring. Why would my toddler know this song? It didn't make any sense that my daughter was talking about this Titanic and singing a song from the 30s. But nothing could have prepared us for what went wrong on our next family vacation.
From the moment Elijah could speak, he talked about an older brother. I didn't really think much of it, but then he started saying other weird things. One time, Elijah and I were playing, and he just matter-of-factly turned to me and said, Mommy, my brother died in the army. He was shot. Up until that time, I had been reassuring him about his older brother in Senegal, but this was something else. This was something new. I never have a son who <laughs> just got killed, and uh, I started like just thinking about how he knows even about death at the time. It was it was just so scary and confusing. He seemed to be concerned. And we would have to explain to him, honey, we don't know this brother you're talking about. Your brother that you have is in Senegal and he's alive and he's fine. And he would say, no, no. He wanted me to tell him what happened, but I had to explain to him, I don't know what happened. This was all before he started daycare. He wasn't watching anything other than these two kid shows that he was obsessed with, and that's all he ever watched. So it was scary to hear him say things like that, and I didn't know where he was picking it up, you know, and who from, and I felt helpless. I was in the army and I went to some wars. I don't know how a two-year-old gonna be starting talking about war. And I never told him about me bringing the army, I don't know where he really got it. He was uh, mentioning people getting killed. I just played it off and hoped that he would forget about it and change the subject. Between ages two and four, he started with something else. And he just matter-of-factly said, well, you know, God makes us learn lessons in life. If we don't learn them, we have to, to go again. He has very intricate details about this whole process. He says everyone goes through with God. We come from a mixed family, and um, I'm American, and my husband is Senegalese. His religion is Muslim, and so is mine. We have taught our children basic Muslim beliefs. What Elaji was saying that we have to choose our families again and uh, going through a process with God to see if we learned our lessons or not, and that determining that we go to live again or not, that's not part of the Muslim belief. I didn't know where this was coming from at all. It was just kind of shocking, like, wow, he's actually thinking about these deep concepts. I want him to be a believer like me, believe in God, believe in life and death. I started to wonder what was happening to my little boy. My daughter Raleigh was born with gray hair knew about the Titanic, and also sang a burlesque song from the 1930s by heart. I wondered where was this all coming from? And time went on, and life was pretty normal. When Riley was around three, we decided to take a trip to Jekyll Island. Jekyll Island is located off the coast of Georgia. It's a small island with a lot of nature and animals around it, but it also has a lot of history. In the 1920s and the turn of the century, people from up north that had many vacation homes there on Jekyll Island. The first morning of our vacation, we went to a natural beach. We were walking down the beach and Raleigh made an announcement that she'd been here before. And I told her, you have never been here, honey thinking that maybe she'd been mistaken about it. And she says, no, Mama, it's not when you were alive, not when you were here. She says, you weren't my Mama then. 
I was confused about what she was saying to me. It was hard to hear her say, you're not my mom. She was very adamant in saying that she had been to that beach before. She's never been to Jekyll prior to that moment. After lunch, we decided that we were gonna take a historic tour. And the first house that we stopped at was the Rockefeller Cottage. Riley was running up the steps and she ran inside and there are these velvet ropes. She tried to go through them, which the tour director stopped her. She was so happy to be in there and she's just running around and I'm trying to get a hold of her to calm her down. Riley's never been that happy or excited to be someplace. And she never acted like that anywhere else. She was telling us, we sat over here for reading, we ate over here. And then she started saying this isn't the right furniture, that the plateware wasn't their plateware. Tour director started laughing and he says, has she been on the tour before? And I said, she's never been here before. How does Riley know that this is not the correct dinnerware? A three-year-old would normally not even think about something like that. When we were trying to get her out first, like, come on, it's time to go, she was like, I'm not leaving. This is where I belong. She was just pulling, no. refusing to come. Finally, I ended up having to pick her up physically and carry her out. No. No. And she immediately says, I have to go back there. That's my home. That's where I lived. That's where my real family is. I was embarrassed, first of all, that she was acting this way, thinking that she's never had a fit before. And I was like, I have to stop this. I have to calm her down. And so I forbid the mention of Jekyll Island in the home. When Riley came back from Jekyll Island, she wasn't playing with the children. You could tell that she was upset. After she went back to preschool, I was stopped in the hall by her teacher. And she told me, was there something going on because Riley had been talking about being taken away from her real home and her real family. She had the teacher convinced something was wrong and something was going on. I couldn't believe my own daughter had accused me of kidnapping her. On a trip to Jekyll Island, Georgia, my three-year-old daughter was convinced that the Rockefeller Cottage was her home. She refused to leave and told her preschool teacher that I had kidnapped her from her real family. Well, I was shocked. I can't believe Riley is telling everybody that we took her away from her real home, her family, and I'm having to go around explaining to people when it started and when it happened. I never thought I would have to defend that my daughter, Riley, was my daughter. I was starting to get really worried. Medley is a very loving mother, very attentive mother. It never crossed my mind that something would be wrong at home because they were just that kind of a family. My belief is that time is not a straight line, but it's a circle and that we all come around. The first thing that popped into my mind was, did she have a past life coming back to her? It just was very confusing that this is happening in our house with our child, and she is really having a hard time. So as a mother, you're trying to rationalize it, but I kind of have a strict religious upbringing. It was hard for me to believe that my child was going through this. When I suggested to Medley that it could have been a past life, the thought had never crossed her mind that that could possibly have been what the problem was. That was the first moment when I considered that this was some type of reincarnation or a past life experience. Couldn't understand where it came from, but I'm starting to believe this is happening, but I just still want to just put it in a box and forget it. Things started taking a scary turn at this point. Riley started telling her stepsisters that there was a man appearing. She said she'd see him materialize in the bedroom, and sometimes he would walk from the closet to the door. And I couldn't see him, they couldn't see him, but she firmly believed he was there. 
She wasn't frightened of the figure. This was somebody she felt like she had known before. The only thing she was frightened of was the dreams. She described to me a wooden staircase. She can remember descending the staircase, looking down at the man, and then he's waiting for her. She said she didn't understand the meaning of the dream. She just felt like she needed to get to the bottom of the staircase to this person. The dream just ends right there. When Riley had woke up from her dream, she had like anxiety. She would be streaming tears and shaking and just didn't want to talk. I wondered what was happening to my child. I couldn't help her and I didn't know what was going on. My son, Al-Haji, talked about an older brother who was killed. He was so upset when he would speak of this, I didn't know how to help him. Then he described talking to God in heaven. Things were quiet for a while, and then something else happened. Al-Haji started telling me about dreaming. It started to get a little more intense when he was older. He would scream in the middle of the night and I would have to come in his room and console him. He would say that he dreamt about war. He gonna be talking about the killings and all those people coming to him. I'm trying to explain to him not to believe in whatever he's seeing. He's so scared, sometimes even he gonna uh, get up in the middle of the night. He has to have the lights on all the time or the TV on all the time. He would say that he dreamt about war and he would still say things about his brother. I just don't want him to believe in that. And I always explain to him, no, you don't have a brother. You are L.I.G. You are my son. But sometimes he's just saying it like he, he know what he's saying all of the details that Elaji has been saying throughout the years have been consistent. They haven't changed at all. I started to wonder, is he remembering a past life? My brother died when he was 19. I have dreams about like what happened with my brother. I was trying to get answers, piece, more pieces to the puzzle, so I asked him, is there anything else that you remember? He told me that he thinks he was 45 when he died. And he says, well, I do remember these numbers, one, nine, five, nine. And I put it together in my head. I said, that's a year. I thought, well, it could be his year of birth. If he was really born in 1959, and like he says, died at age 45, that would have meant he would have died around 2004, 2005. El Haji was born in 2006. I researched war and the 1959 that he was talking about and Vietnam War era popped up. 1959 was the start of the Vietnam War. So if who El Haji was, was born in 1959 and he was around four or five when his brother supposedly died, that would have meant uh, his brother was fighting in a war during the Vietnam War era. There were many men that died at 19 in the Vietnam War. That was the moment when I realized he must be telling about something that did really happen. My son, El Haji, was constantly talking about his brother being shot in the war at age 19. I started to wonder if he was remembering a past life and if his brother had died in the Vietnam War. It was a really emotional time for us. 
I said, if you really can remember that your brother did go to the military, do you remember where you lived, about your life? And he said, yeah, I lived in Canada. Just <laughs> like that. <laughs> All I know is that U.S. men fled to Canada in order to not go to Vietnam. It just wasn't adding up. I lived in Canada, but I died when I was 45. I don't remember how I died. When he told me that, I thought maybe it wasn't the Vietnam War because Canada didn't fight in it. But then I thought, let me just do some research. I found out that although Canada was neutral in the war, about 30,000 Canadians actually joined the war in the Vietnam. Of those men, 110 died, and seven were missing in action. It all started coming together real quick, and that was a big moment for me, that to find out that what he was actually saying was true. Monica just think, Maybe Elijah was here in another life and just come back. But my religion does not allow me to believe on that. I do believe that one of those 110 men were probably Elhaji's brother that were killed in action. It makes me sad when I think about him dying. Like I still think about him. There must have been some trauma in his other life for him to carry it over to this life. Remember, it, it must have went deep. Maybe he just never got to say goodbye. Like, God wants us to know something, but if we don't do it, like, we have to do our life again. You have to live a lot of lives before you get it right. LRG scare me right now. As a father, I want him to have a normal life. He's not gonna be just scared all his life thinking about those things. I wanna take him to a place where these fallen soldiers have, are honored and so they aren't forgotten. Maybe seeing that they aren't forgotten will allow him to move on. I'm really hoping that I can finally help him find closure. From the time my daughter Riley was a toddler, she's been saying and doing things we could not explain. She had an intense connection to Jekyll Island and a memory of who she was when she lived there. I've made a conscious effort not to take her back to Jekyll Island, because I thought that it would cause problems. She started having nightmares. The way Raleigh described the dreams, to me, I knew she was seeing something. I was frustrated. It was something we just couldn't understand. My name is Riley, and I'm 18 years old. I've been having this dream since I went to Jekyll Island of me descending down to this man with a little hat on. And my dream just kind of stopped, and I never make it to the guy. I think it means my past life, I died in a situation where I didn't get to finish something with this guy, or I had an ending that wasn't the way it was supposed to go. Maybe it's because she hasn't completed something. It's so frustrating to her, and she just feels like she needs to finish it. It frightens me because I'm wondering if something traumatic happened. Or did somebody hurt her in a past life? It was something we just couldn't understand. If she did have a past life, who was she? When she was older and she was like, why didn't you help me find the answers? And then I was like, oh, I should have done that. So I thought I was protecting her. I hope I didn't miss a chance for her to get the answers. And that bothers me because she really wants the answers. And I hope it's not too late to find them. Raleigh's now 18 years old. She just graduated from high school. And she really wants to go back to Jekyll Island. And we have planned a trip to return to Jekyll Island.
When I speak about Jekyll Island or talk about it or even bring up the dreams and stuff that I had, I tend to get upset. Sometimes I'll cry, sometimes it'll make me happy. It just changes emotions within. But I know that I need to go on discovering what happened. I'm hoping that learning more about it will help me move on. I'm nervous about just finding out something I don't want to find out, it changing me somehow. There's multiple things that could happen, and it scares me. I hope this trip is not going to be a big mistake. My son, El Haji, was constantly talking about his brother being shot in the war at age 19. And he says, well, I do remember these numbers, one, nine, five, nine. I've researched in war, and if who El Haji was, was born in 1959, that would have meant uh, his brother was fighting in a Vietnam War era. My kids, I love them, and I want them to have normal life. Keep out of fountain. We're going to go down this way because I have something to show you. Right now, we're at the Veterans Memorial Park. I really wanted to take Olaji here so that we can kind of acknowledge the facts that he did have this past life. Um, I'm not denying it in any way. That way, he can move on and have some closure with it. There's a special reason we could be here today. We're here Hi. to honor your brother that was a soldier. Well, soldiers actually fought in different wars, and we're gonna go to the Vietnam Memorial. I don't want him to feel um, sad anymore. I want him to be El Haji. I want him to know who he is in this life, that he has a purpose in this life, and be El Haji, be my son. Look at all these names. Dang. These are all names of people that died serving their country in the Vietnam War. Someone left something here special. I know your brother's name is not on this list, probably. I guess it could be, you never know. There's years up here. 1962, 63, 64, 65. No, 63. You think it was? It was 63. When he died? Mm-hmm. You can say goodbye to your brother. No. Why not, no. buddy? You don't want to focus on living this life? I You're kind of do, but not too much. But this is a memorial, and it's a place to remember. So we're never going to forget him. You can say goodbye to your brother so that you can focus on this life. It's OK to let go now, because that was the last life, and this is this life. You understand that? Mm hmm I understand. Good. You can just say goodbye. And when we put our soldier down, I hope mm -hmm. that gives you some peace. This is about Elijah having closure with his life. I don't want him to forget his past life at all, but I need him to focus on the now. And basically, the whole point of what we did today was to remember that he did have a brother but he doesn't have to be sad about it anymore. He can move on. We are at Jekyll Island, and we are trying to help Raleigh come to terms with what has been bothering her over the years.
Yes, we were pulling into the compound. I started getting really nervous about how she was going to react and how this was going to be for her. This trip, I hope, will help her. Maybe it'll help me feel better about not asking her questions in the past or talking about it. I'm feeling different emotions. You all right? Excited and nervous. <laughs> you all right? <laughs> yeah. All my life, I'd had this feeling that there was something missing from me. I'm hoping by coming back to Jekyll Island that I will find what was missing or finish something that will cause me to feel 100%. I'm hoping to find a name and find out more about my memories and maybe connect to my past life in the way I did when I was younger. Hello. Hi. Hi, I'm Riley. Riley, I'm John Hunter. I'm Medley. Medley, nice to meet y'all. Good to have you back on Jekyll. Yeah, it's <laughs> great to be back. Take a stroll and take a look inside and okay. show you a little bit of the cottage. Come on in. Um, that hat over there is kind of like the one in my dream from the bottom, but I think it was shorter. Well, if it was shorter, it may have been a, a bowler hat, which would have been rounded a little bit more. I do definitely feel like I have lived here before. Oh, I really like those beds. I even had the random memory of sleeping in that bed and waking up in it. And those are <laughs> ones that we know have been in the house. I definitely feel like a lot of the um, furniture is um, in the wrong place. It seemed like I was getting so many different vibes from different rooms. I'm just like, I'm happy to be here, and at the same time, for some reason, it's like this feeling of like just being mad. We're at Jekyll Island, and I do feel like I belong here. Seemed like I was getting so many different vibes from different rooms. I'm just like, I'm happy to be here. And at the same time, for some reason, it's like this feeling of like just being mad, like that the house has been like moved around type of feeling. <laughs> it's really weird. <sighs> right now, I can't even process everything because it's just so much at one time. <sighs> you want to go into the? Yeah, we'll go into the next one. OK. I am. Thank God these were actually the stairs from the dream. Because of the stained glass window and um, the shape of this. Yeah. The fact that I got to see the staircase really was the emotional part. <sighs> that was such a major detail. Always looking down and seeing the rug, like almost a pathway to the guy at the end. Can you do it? Can you go up? Yeah, I think I can. OK. It confirmed also the fact that something probably happened on the staircase. Yeah, the railing feels the same in the, um, in the dream. Possibly my death, or possibly I fell and got hurt. Wow. And I definitely feel like I didn't get to finish the staircase ever. I'm so happy I found it. I'm really looking forward to sitting down and getting to look at pictures and names. And I'm nervous and excited about if he's going to have something for me that pops out. The peak of the Jekyll Island Club right. was during really the 20s and early 30s. The home was purchased by William Rockefeller. His idea really was to have a place that was big enough to bring all of his, his children or grandchildren at one time. And so from 1917 uh, until his death in 1922, the family came pretty much every winter I've always been drawn to the um, 20s style of clothing as well. Maybe that's where it's coming from. Yeah, possibly. And the song was late 20s, early yeah. 30s. Things started to make sense why she knew the Titanic sunk and why she knew a risque song from the 1930s. So we have a few things mm -hmm. um, that we gathered up. These are some of the members of the Rockefeller family, William and Elmira Rockefeller. This photograph we have William Rockefeller again with his uh, daughter Emma. She seemed very familiar to me. Just the name Emma caught me. Yeah, this hat looks like the one that the guy was wearing at the bottom of the stairs. 
It's very familiar. And then, of course, they had some of their grandchildren here. In this photo here, we have Geraldine. She was a granddaughter of William Rockefeller, daughter of Emma, who you saw in the picture. Her face looks really familiar to me. There is a gut instinct about Geraldine. The name even sounded kind of familiar, too. I'm thinking she had a strong influence in my past life. And Emma Rockefeller is actually Geraldine's mother, which was very interesting to me because both of them stood out to me. Do you know if anybody died in this house? Um, yes, actually. Elmira Rockefeller passed away here in 1920. And William passed away two years later. So the family almost abandoned the house after that point and then sold it. Wow. The fact that I got these names and got to see pictures of them, I feel more connected now. Thank you so much for taking the time to do this for me. Oh, I you're welcome. I feel like it helped very pleasure. much. It was nice meeting nice you. Nice meeting you. The fact that I was able to finish going down the stairs was a really big thing to me because maybe possibly that was what I was supposed to complete in my past life. And now that I have, it feels like a huge burden has been lifted. Initially, I felt nervous about bringing her back to Jekyll Island, but at the end of the day, I feel like it was a good experience. I feel that I have closure now about my past life and that I'm gonna be able to move on when I get back home. I hope that my dream will be complete and I'll get to go down the stairs or see what happened while going downstairs. My son was remembering events that did not happen in his life, and he said, are we going to see my old dad? When his old dad came back from the war, the house had to be dark and quiet. When he would get upset or angry, he would pound his head on the floor. And he started saying, when my old dad was in the war, his friends had to pick him up and carry him to safety. And he said that there was blood spilling. Then he said he was in a car driving like this on a road and that his car wrecked. That was the moment that I realized that Riley might be remembering a past life. I thought that they would think he's crazy. Am I really hearing what I'm hearing? I was convinced that my brother's soul had come back to me and my son. My name is Joanna, and I have two sons named Riley and Aiden. My two sons are six and three. Sacramento is a really great place to live. It's the capital of California. There's about 500,000 people here. We live in a smaller area. When you go downtown, it feels like a big city, but it's a great place to raise kids. Hi, I'm Nick. I'm Riley Naden's father. I'm an attorney. I work with abused and neglected kids or children at risk of abuse and neglect. My work deals with the most difficult things you can imagine that happen to children. And so I've heard lots of very difficult stories from kids. I am a marriage and family therapist. I work with kids 0 to 21, and I see a lot of trauma and a lot of families that are struggling. So I'm more careful about how I parent and how I'm raising the boys so that we create like a loving environment. We had actually been told that we weren't going to be able to have kids. I had some abdominal problems, and they never figured out what it was. I was definitely afraid because I didn't understand what was going on with me physically. It was, it was a shock to us, and I think we were both trying to adjust to that. Nick was in law school, I was in grad school, and our plan was to start trying after we graduated. My OB said, try now because it could take up to a year. So uh, we started trying and we were pregnant within a month. <laughs> we were like in shock, and we just stared at each other, and he hugged me, and I hugged him, and we were like, oh my gosh, what just happened? Riley was gorgeous when he was born. He, he came out, he looked perfect. He had this beautiful little face. He was loving, he was very sweet, and he started talking really young and had a great vocabulary. He was always comfortable with older folks. Even, even as a baby, he was very engaging to people. We noticed Riley was having a hard time sleeping, I think, in the hospital. He was a horrible sleeper, he always was. He'd sleep about 20 minutes and then wake up screaming. I remember Nick and I looking at each other one night and we're like, what have we done? This is just so exhausting. We never thought it would be like this. 
We were exhausted a lot and fussy as parents because he'd wake up. When he was about three or four, he would wake up and be having like night terrors. He would wake up in the middle of the night screaming and we would go in and realize that he was not awake. And so we would sit there with him until he settled back into bed. I remember feeling just sort of at a loss for what to do. I ended up being hard on myself because I, I thought I was doing something wrong. I'd say probably four or five times out of the week he comes into our bed and we're not really sure why. And then one day, I think we were driving and he said something like, are we going to see my old dad? Nick and I kind of looked at each other and we laughed. Oh, ha ha. And then I made a joke. I kind of hit Nick on the shoulder. I said, he just called you old. He said, no, I'm not saying you're old. I'm talking about my old dad. And then we were very shocked. He started giving more details about his old dad. It would be in the car ride. I'd pick him up from daycare. I'd say, oh, how was your day? And he'd say, oh, my old dad used to ask me that all the time. And are you going to take me to see my old dad? And, and then he would say things like thingamajigger and wonky. And I'd say, oh, where'd you learn that word? Oh, my old dad. It was at least one conversation a day. He would mention his old dad. For me, I was like, well, I'm your dad, so <laughs> what's this about? I just wanted to hear what he had to say. I think sometimes it would come up for him when I would ask him to do something, and the response would be, well, my old dad wouldn't make me do that stuff. <laughs> I said, well, he's not here right now. I thought, OK, what's going on here? Because for months, he's been talking about this old dad. I sort of freaked out, because I thought, there's way more to this than we thought. Nick just said, there's nothing more to it. Don't read so much into it. As he gave me more detail, then I started to feel confused and worried about what was going on for him. Centennial is a city southeast of Denver. Centennial is great because of its close proximity to Denver. Centennial was formed 15 years ago. There's a lot of kids in the neighborhood, has great schools, lots of parks, walking trails, community centers that are good for families to have around. My name is Trenny. I have four children, one girl and three boys. My pregnancy with Noah was probably the easiest out of the four. I gained very little weight, ate super healthy, jogging and walking up until the day he was born. Noah was a very hard-headed and loving baby. He was just a happy-go-lucky, free-spirited little boy. Fun to be around, fun to play with. He walked at about nine months and just took off running. When he was 18 months old, he jumped on a battery-powered four-wheeler and took off across the cul-de-sac in his diaper. He just, he was all boy. <laughs> Noah was very much a rebel, very stubborn. <laughs> definitely had his own agenda from day one. When he would get upset or angry, he would pound his head on the floor. I remember telling Noah not to go down the slide when my daughter, his sister, was still sitting at the bottom of it. And he looked at me and laughed and did it anyway. And then his teeth went into her head, and she ended up with stitches. Going into toddler and preschool, he had some very bad speech impediments and he could not speak clearly, and it was very hard for people to understand him. My mom had a really hard time understanding him. I even had a hard time. When Noah was around three years old, I was driving and had my daughter with me, and he kept looking at me in the rearview mirror trying to get my attention. I was totally tuned out, totally ignoring him. I just thought he was being a kid because they'll say mom, mom, mom a dozen times. All of a sudden, my three-year-old son glares at me in the mirror and he says, damn it, Hanny, listen, listen to, me. to me. I had to pull over because my toddler just swore at me and to hear that name come out of my son's mouth really shook me up. I was at work and Trini called me and she was crying. And I said, what is wrong? And she said, you're not gonna believe what just happened. 
The last time I heard someone call me Hanny would have been before my brother's passing. No one else called her Hanny, not her friends, not her dad, not me. It was a name that Craig had for Trini and called her that. My brother died in 1993 and Noah was born in 1998. So there's no way anyone would have told Noah what my nickname was as a child. Hanny! When he said, damn it, Hanny, it was crystal clear. His voice lowered and it sounded a little spooky. Listen to me! The hard noises in the back of his throat, like guh, kuh, those things he could not say. So for him to actually make a sound with a guh in the back of his throat was very shocking to me. Listen to me! I don't even know what was going through my mind. I actually started to shake and I cried. And while I'm doing that, my daughter's in the back seat and she said, why are you calling mommy Hanny? And he looked at her and he said, because she is Hanny. And he looked back at me and he said, you know you're Hanny. Clearly it was an emotional moment for her. I could hear it in her voice when she called me, but I did not think that there was a connection with his uncle Craig at the moment. I tried to explain the situation to her and I think she was a little in disbelief at what I was saying, maybe because he did have poor speech, but I knew what I had heard. There is no way that Noah could have known those words because we never talked about it. When Noah was three, I didn't think he had a concept of what death actually was, and I didn't feel it was appropriate to discuss with him how his uncle had died because it was somewhat violent. To hear that name come out of my son's mouth, it really shook me up, but I could have never predicted what happened next. I was super excited when we found out that we were pregnant with Riley because just a few months before that, we were told we weren't going to be able to have kids. Soon after we brought him home, we noticed he had some difficulty with sleeping. It was a really exhausting few months. I remember feeling really lost and confused. I started thinking, is he mentally ill? Is he hallucinating, seeing or hearing things? That was probably one of the first places my brain went, but I also knew that he was probably too young for that because I work in the mental health field. I remember specifically one night, me and Riley were in his room, and then he started saying, when my old dad was in the war, he used to have this old uniform, and he wore this old hat and it was gray, and he got stabbed in the shoulder. And his friends had to pick him up and carry him to safety because he almost died. And he said that there was blood spilling out of his shoulder, and they couldn't stop the blood, so they were trying to put clothes and stuff on the wound. I was shocked. I didn't know what to believe. I just let him continue talking because I thought, what is he going to say next? He described them as looking tired and having smoke on their face. He described some as having blood on their uniforms. He said that when his old dad came back from the war, the house had to be dark and quiet, and if he made noise, he would get in trouble. He described his old dad as very sensitive from when he came back from war. I remember feeling devastated because I thought, why should any three-year-old have these images in his head? I'm a little bit more skeptical, I think, of things. To me, Riley has a very powerful imagination. and It was more like his creative mind working. I was very much like that when I was a kid, too. It really tortured me. I had a difficult time sleeping that night because I thought, why is my three-year-old thinking about war and blood and his dad being injured in an environment where it had to be very quiet and sterile. And Nick is an awesome dad. He's very easygoing. We never watch any adult programs around Riley. We were very careful with that. We always had some kind of kid show on. So I started asking all of our friends, when Riley's been at your house, have you watched any adult TV around him? 
no, no, no. All the answers were no. So I went to a friend who's a marriage and family therapist. It was somebody that knew him for a long time and sort of knew our lifestyle and how we live, hoping that she would at least maybe say, no, don't even worry about it, he's fine. So I just reached out to her and I said, hey, you know, Riley started talking about this old dad, do you think I should be worried? And the look on her face was like, uh, yeah, you should be worried. You might need to take him to the doctor, there might be something wrong with him. I just broke down in tears and I called Nick immediately. If you're a therapist, anytime somebody tells you something that's maybe it looks a little bit different, they think mental illness. Didn't want to hear that. I didn't think Riley was crazy. He's not crazy in a clinical sense. He's crazy like a little boy is crazy. I was concerned. I felt alone. I was afraid to tell people because I thought that they would think he's crazy. My son Noah was happy and healthy and stubborn and funny, and it was such a delight to have a son. My daughter would listen to any direction that you gave her and followed it, but Noah always had his own agenda and doing his own things and not listening to us. He actually had no memory of saying any of those things, and he was right back to Noah with the speech problems. I chalked this behavior up to him just being a very hard-headed boy. Then another thing happened. We were watching TV, and there was a bunch of planes and helicopters flying over. Noah pointed and said, that's a spy plane. He did not have his stutter. He did not mispronounce words. He was using and saying all consonants properly. I said, you don't know what a spy plane is. And he said, I do too know what a spy plane is because my daddy took me to see one. I asked him about the spy plane that he said his daddy had taken him to see. He did say it was black. I called my husband and I asked him had he taken Noah anywhere to go see any black planes, specifically spy planes, and he said no. He had no idea what I was talking about. Maybe he had seen storybooks, maybe he had seen a movie, because little boys have fantasies about those things, and it would be natural for children to imagine in their mind that they had actually been in one. My father was in the Marines. He was a lieutenant, and my brother had been stationed with him and my mom over in Okinawa during Vietnam. So I called my dad and asked him if he had ever heard of a spy plane. And he said, yes, he had, that one came on base, and he had taken my brother to see it. And when I asked him what color it was, he said it was black. Noah's father had not taken him to see a spy plane. Craig's father had. There are no pictures of my dad in the military at all in my house. There's no pictures of my brother living in Okinawa. There was none of that in the house. He kept saying, but I was there with my daddy. My daddy was there with me. He took me to this plane. It wasn't like he was imagining that he had been in a plane somewhere, but he was very specific that his daddy had taken him to that plane. There's no way that Noah could have known about the spy plane and that my brother had gone to go see a spy plane with our father. And my dad was living out of state at the time, so he had very little contact with the kids, so he would have not ever said something about the story or anything. My dad actually had to stop and think when I called and asked him about it. I felt confused. It was just a lot to process. I started to feel like there was some inexplicable connection between Noah and Craig, but I was shocked by what he said next. My six-year-old son Riley started talking about his old dad from the moment he could talk. He gave me details about his old dad coming home from the war and what that was like for him. I reached out to a friend and my worst fear happened. She thought that there was something wrong with him.
I felt worried and confused and scared. The logical part of my brain knew that it wasn't mental illness. I've worked with chronically mentally ill kids and adults for 16 years. Yes, there are cases where young children do hear voices and respond, but it is so rare. My fear was that he was going to be different and that people would treat him differently. I never really thought about past lives, but then I started doing research and I contacted this doctor and told her Riley's story. She seemed to think that it was a past life. I wasn't that sure. Riley described his house as kind of light before his dad went to war, and then when his dad came home from the war, it was that it was dark. His dad needed the house to be dark, like the curtains couldn't be open, there couldn't be any lights on. He described things before the war as in fast motion, and after the war, that things were in slow motion. And he had to be quiet, and if him and his brother ran through the house and made noise, his dad would scream and yell. So it really needed to be very quiet and physically very dark. I immediately thought he was describing PTSD. Post-traumatic stress disorder, usually when people have something traumatic happen to them, they have flashbacks or nightmares. And so generally people that are going through this want things quiet or dark or they want to be left alone. There's no way a three, four-year-old could describe PTSD like that without like having maybe experienced it. That was the moment that I realized that Riley might be remembering a past life. It's not what I believe necessarily, but Riley, it's very real to him. And he was really little when he was describing it. So it was fascinating to hear him have all of these details. But it makes me a little bit sad that he has this memory of something that was hard. I was heartbroken when Riley was telling me that his old dad was mean to him. Which guy am I? Nick does not need a quiet house. I'm not quiet. He's fine with the boys running around, playing and being silly and being loud. I came as far as I can. The boys adore their dad. I was very interested in to hear what he had to say about those things. I wanted to hear more about these details as they, as they arose. Some of the stuff he described sounded almost like Civil War era or World War I era, and I don't know where those would have come from. I have no idea why, but I just said, does your old dad have a name? I was not expecting him to say a name. My son called me by a nickname only my brother used. Hanny! And he remembered seeing a plane that my brother had only seen. I was really confused and worried about what was going on. When Noah was around four, Noah's dad and I had taken the kids out to eat and we had already ordered our food. We were just sitting there having normal conversation. The kids were drawing on the kids' menu and Noah abruptly stands up on the booth and holds his arms up in a big circle. And he said, when I was here before, I died. And I asked him, when you were where? And he said, here, mom, here. And I said, on earth? He said, yes on Earth. And he took his hand and he said he was in a car driving like this on a road and that his car wrecked, caught on fire, and that he died. This really made the hair on my neck stand up because that's exactly how my brother died five years before Noah was even born. The night my brother passed away, he had gone to the state fair with some of his friends to go to a concert. So at 3.20 a.m. on Sunday, I woke up, just woke up out of a dead sleep. I looked out my window and the car was not there, so I knew he wasn't home and I couldn't go back to sleep. The next morning, the telephone rang. It was Craig and Trini's father, my ex-husband, and he told me that Craig had had this accident and had died. 
It was just, it was awful. It was a single car crash and the, the car had rolled. He had been ejected from the car. The car had burned. I learned later that Trenny and I and Craig's father had all woken up at 3.20 a.m. We were in three different locations and we all woke up at the same time because we believe that's the exact time that he died. I know there was definitely drinking going on, and I know there was some sort of discussion at some point. Somebody had tried to take his keys away from him. He got quite belligerent and said, no, I'm going, and would not let them take his keys, and he left. Losing my brother, even though it's been over 20 years ago, still deeply affects me to this day. By the time Noah was around three years old, I didn't really talk about my brother a lot. I'm not sure at that point he even knew that I had a brother. I don't remember anyone talking about Craig's car crash in front of Noah as a young child. When Noah talked about being here before and hearing him recount his own physical death was pretty freaky. We thought we had put the past behind us when my brother passed, but I started to believe more and more that Noah was reincarnated. My mom wasn't so convinced, but that changed one night when Noah said something to her that he could have never known. My six-year-old son Riley believed he had an old dad who fought in a war and was injured while fighting in that war. I was shocked. I, I didn't know what to believe. I mean, he would tell these details like it was just like reading a book. It was just matter of fact, and that's the way it was. He actually drew a picture of his old dad's house one time, showed me where everything was. It was almost like I could bend there with him, and I could really visualize what he was talking about, because that's how specific he was. Things that he drew and said about his old family is nothing like how we are now. The memories that Riley shared about himself when he was young was that he remembers being small and that his mom would take care of him, but this old dad must have made an impression on him because he was the focus of a lot of Riley's early memories. The person that he described was consistent throughout. After that, he shared that his dad used to fly a plane and that it had guns on it. I have no idea why, but I just said, does your old dad have a name? And he said, Cedric Pocker. I was not expecting him to say a name. We don't know anyone named Cedric. And usually if you see the name spelled, sometimes people pronounce it Cedric, but he said specifically Cedric. And I said, well, where did you hear that name? And he said, well, he told me. Later that night, I put him to bed, and I started doing some research on the internet. I typed in Cedric Pocker, and what came up was a Cedric Popkin who shot down a Fokker airplane. And it sounded just like Pocker. My heart just sank. And all of a sudden, I was like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I found something. A lot of the details of Cedric's life matched what Riley has told me. My name is Riley. I'm six. My old dad's name was Cedric. He flew a plane with guns on it. He came back from the war different. He had two uniforms, dark green and gray. Cedric Popkin was born in Australia in 1890. In 1916, when World War I broke out, Cedric enlisted. He was stationed with the 17th Machine Gun Company based in France, and they happened to wear gray uniforms. It's believed that Cedric Popkin fired the shot that is famous for shooting down the Red Baron. The Red Baron was famous, and this is something that followed Cedric for the rest of his life. About two months after killing the Red Baron, he suffered wounds that resulted in his right leg being amputated. 
After that injury, Cedric returned home. Cedric had two sons. His sons were Roland and Michael that both died over 50 years ago. The interesting thing is that they both died before their father. It was interesting that there were so many similarities between some of the facts that Riley had described. All this time we thought we had a little kid that was talking about an old dad. Maybe it was his imagination. But as soon as I saw that connection, I thought, wow, this is, this is real. There's validity to what he's saying. It could be a possibility that Riley is one of Cedric Popkins' sons, but I'm not sure. I don't know the answers. I don't have any proof or disproof of any of that stuff because, in my view, you can't have proof of those kinds of things. At least I haven't seen it. I don't know what it would take to convince me. I guess I would know it when I saw it, right? It would have to be something definitive, which I don't expect is coming anytime soon. When I was doing research, I realized that most people who have experienced a past life, they experienced it themselves. Riley's case was a little different because he was really experiencing a past life from his dad's perspective and what his dad went through. For him to hang on to those memories in that relationship, that relationship must have been very powerful. In my research, I did find some photos of Cedric. I just kind of wanted to see what he would say. So I put down an array of old time pictures and then put the one in of Cedric just kind of in the middle and asked Riley if any of those look familiar to him. What I saw next amazed me. My six-year-old son Riley believed he had an old dad from a previous life. He said his father had been injured and that the men wore gray uniforms. What I saw next amazed me. I put down an array of photos. Some were just pictures of soldiers from the old days, and one of them was Cedric Popkin. And when I put those photos out, Riley touched Cedric Popkin's picture first. I didn't want to be like, oh, yeah, that's him. But inside, I was like, oh, my gosh, I can't believe he just picked this guy. This is the guy that matched the name in the airplane. So yeah, it was kind of an eye-opener for me. His old dad could be Cedric Popkin. I'm not sure, but I'm OK with either way. I think it's interesting to think that a boy that had traumatic memories in his past life is now with a family that has a dad that is an advocate for children and a mom that's a marriage and family therapist for children. And things are much different for him now. As somebody who works with kids, I just try to be supportive and encouraging and you know let them know that that's not how we roll in our family. Nick is an awesome dad. He's funny and very loving, and they have a very special bond. We talk a lot about making sure that he knows that we love him and that we're here for him. And I have no doubt that he understands that I love him and that I am his father and that he doesn't have another father, certainly at this point and that he can come to me with anything. And I think he believes that and understands that. I love my mom and dad. We laugh a lot and play soccer. I'm happy that I have my parents. I think if you met Riley and you didn't know this about him, if he never told you about his old dad, you would never know that there was anything different about him. I would say that he's a normal six-year-old who plays soccer and t-ball and hangs out with his friends and goes swimming and eats pizza. He just happens to remember having an old dad. Metal fast, there you go. That's it. I don't think that this is going to be something that troubles him later in life or anything along those lines. You're on your own. I'm too tired to keep running. You're on your own. He's a super engaging person. That's my boy. And he sincerely cares about the kids. <laughs> Victory dance. The thought that maybe he did go through some of those hard times, it makes me feel sad. Yes. But I also feel happy knowing that he's come out on the other side with us. Watch out for the tree! No! 
we're gonna make this life for him a very positive one. <laughs> My son remembered dying in a horrific car accident. My brother died in a drunk driving accident before my son was ever born. I knew that my son Noah had a past life and that past life was my brother. My mom wasn't so sure. When Noah was seven, he was having a sleepover at my house. I was getting ready to tuck him in, and he looked up at me and said, Nana, I need Froggy. And I stopped in my tracks, and I said, what do you mean, Froggy? And he goes, you know, the Froggy I always sleep with. I'm in disbelief. And I said, what color is Froggy? He's yellow, Nana, you know Froggy. All of a sudden, I'm having flashbacks of Craig. He always slept with Froggy. Froggy is a handmade stuffed animal made by my sister, Craig's aunt. She gave it to him when he was six or so, and he just always loved it and slept with it. I had, of course, kept certain favorite things of my kids, Froggy being one of them, but it hadn't been something that I brought out for my grandkids to sleep with or play with. I was thinking, am I really hearing what I'm hearing? So I went to the closet and had to get it down off the top shelf. And I said, are you talking about this Froggy? And his eyes got really big and he broke into this big smile and took it from me and hugged it and said, there's my froggy. I was immediately a little weepy because it brought back so many memories. I mean, we couldn't go anywhere without that froggy. Craig took it everywhere. Noah had never seen this frog before. It had never been talked about before. That, that was the moment for me because now it was something really tangible in my house. That was the first time that I thought to myself, there's something really special about this boy. All of these other things that have happened now really hit home with me. I remember my mom calling me when Noah had stayed over at her house, and she called me crying. I felt like she was fully convinced at that point. It was a realization that night that Craig's soul was with us. I felt like there was no other explanation but that Craig was reincarnated through Noah. He's not my son, but they share a soul. To watch Noah and see the traits of Craig through him. Once I totally embraced it, it was a comfort and a blessing. It's a blessing. As he was reaching middle school, the anger that Noah was starting to exhibit reminded me of my brother at that age. If he was my brother reincarnated, there may be anger and rage that he would bring forward. And I was really worried. My brother's soul had somehow come back to me as my son. Noah called me by a nickname that only my brother would use. Hanny. Noah talked of a spy plane that only my brother had seen. When Noah asked my mom for a stuffed animal by a name that only my brother would have known, then she started to believe too. I would see him banging his head on the ground and on the walls and really acting out. I was worried that if he was my brother reincarnated, that there may be some difficulties that he would bring forward. Because my brother had some very tough times in his adolescence where he fought a lot of internal anger and rage and didn't always make the best decisions. And I was really worried that something like that might come through with my son. As much as I miss my brother, Noah was my priority, and I wanted to make sure what happened to my brother did not happen to Noah. 
My mom helped me find a very good therapist to help Noah with the anger that he was feeling inside. And in some strange connected way, I felt like maybe I was helping my brother as well. Noah's 16 now. He's really grown into a really balanced human being. My name's Noah. I do believe I was my uncle. The fact that I was my uncle it just amazes me, and I think it's pretty cool. Being different and having a story behind it. I feel like the memories are carried over with me because there's no way I would be able to know all those stories, like my mom's nickname. Honey! Too young to know any of that. Never met my uncle, so there's no way I would be able to know all those. Makes me feel like I'm getting like a second chance. I think the reason that he came back as me is because he messed up and he wants me to make it right and carry on from what he left over. I think that there was troubled times for Craig and I think this is a way for him to heal. His soul is being healed and Noah is learning from Craig's soul and moving forward in a more positive way. Noah's driving now. I think he understands there's a lot of responsibility with that. Every decision can impact his life and somebody else's life, but he's very careful, he's very cautious. So far, he's made really good decisions behind the wheel. I like my friends, you know, they got stories about how family members died from drinking and driving, but I feel like I've like been there and I feel like I've been through it. With my uncle's mistakes, it's just not another story. I feel like my uncle did come back to my mom as me because they were very close and my uncle watched out for my mom. So I feel like I'm gonna still do the same, watch out for her and help her with everything that she needs and do what I can and make sure I don't go down the path that he went down. I think Noah has lived a much happier life than my son did. I think it's another chance for Craig's soul to be happy and enjoy life with his family. It's made him a really good role model for not just his brothers, but also his friends. He's just a really good, even keeled young man. I am beyond proud of where Noah's at today. I am nervous for Noah to turn 21 and to go through his early 20s. I'd be lying if I said it wasn't in the back of my head after what we've been through, but I also have confidence that he will make better decisions. I've done everything I can up until this point to control breaking the cycle, but now Noah's 16, so I have to hand over the keys, and now he's in control of the rest of it. I feel like my uncle did come back to my family so we can break that cycle, and I'm gonna break the cycle. What I learned from this experience is, is anything can happen at any time, so don't take life for granted. Just be you, be smart, and live life. He said he had to go out into the forest. She told me her family got killed. First it was cute when she was telling us about wagons in California, but then it started taking a dark turn. I wasn't so concerned about his stories until he had to have a knife. There was more going on with my daughter than I had realized. He looks over at me and says, you know, you weren't always my mother. I had another family before you. How was I going to help my youngin get past this? I wanted to help my daughter. Trying to be strong about it. Could all his stories be true? Is this actually happening? Was he remembering another life? <laughs> My name's Annette. I live in Brooklyn, New York. I'm a writer and the author of a novel. Brooklyn is a wonderful place to raise a family because there are so many opportunities and so many places to see, so many things to do. There's lots of culture. There's a very low boredom factor here for children. So it's been a great experience raising the boys here. My boys are August and Hayward. Hayward is the firstborn. He's 22 and August is 17. 
When August was born, I was completely shocked. I, I thought that I was going to have a girl. And I remember just staring at him for several minutes because I just couldn't believe it. That was probably the only time in my life where I've ever been completely surprised by something. August, he was very quiet. He's a, a boy of few words because he sucked his thumb and he wouldn't take his thumb out unless he had something important to say. My name is Carlisle and August is my son. August was always very affectionate and I think the biggest thing that I always remember is that he was always very physical. He always threw the ball well. Um, he was always very strong. We had him in a gymnastics class and he was the only kid who could like really hold himself up. He had that real strong intestinal strength. It's sort of like a warrior mentality. He has this very strong sense of honor. And he was always a very, very good and loyal friend. One time, I was reading a story to him early one morning about a bird who falls out of his nest and uh, doesn't know where his mother is. And he's not sure who his mother is. He goes around asking a bunch of animals, are you my mother, are you my mother? I get to the end of the book where the, the little bird does find his mother and he's very happy and the mother is so glad he's, he's safe. And he looks at me and he says, well, I know who my mother is. I know that you're my mother because I saw you from up above the clouds. I looked down at him and I said, really? You saw me from way above? He says, but yeah, before, before I came here. So I said, well, how did you get to me then if you saw me? He says, I had to jump and I had to slide down on a string. And he says, it was a little scary, but I held on and I came all the way down to you. And I said, where? How did you get into me? And he says, well, I came through the top of your head, the crown of your head, all the way down. And he traced his little hand <laughs> down to my stomach. And he didn't break his sentences at all. Like, he, he didn't break his thought. The entire time that he told me, he says, I saw you, I can see everything, and I chose you. He's not somebody who fabricates. He's not somebody who um, repeats things and he doesn't believe in it. He'll say things, and he'll say it looking at you dead in the eye, and say that X, Y, Z. He was so factual about everything. That's why when he told me the story about uh, how he chose me, it stopped me and made me pay attention because he, he would only talk about things meant something to him. It was strange. August was a different type of learner. When we started reading to him and he was learning his ABCs and colors and things like that, he was completely oblivious to that kind of understanding. He, he didn't care about it at all. As a toddler, it was like, what color is this? He'd say yellow, and it was actually green, and he'd just kind of go, okay, that's okay. So he didn't stress over what he viewed to be kind of irrelevant to him and to his peace and to his happiness. Actually, the way that we got him to understand um, math was to play blackjack with him. So he really got the whole concept of, of math and adding things up by playing blackjack. And that speaks to his competitive nature. August is very quietly competitive, and he still is today. Same thing with days of the week and months of the year. They didn't have any context to him. That wasn't uh, interesting to him. He was uh, more fascinated with being outdoors. He was just very different than other children. I wasn't so concerned until he told me something that really surprised me. My name is Jeannie, and we live in Star, South Carolina, and we have six kids. The oldest is our son, and the youngest is five, and that's Olivia. She's the baby. There's only one red light in Star, and the population is right at 190 people. Everybody knows everybody, and we're just like a family. 
you will definitely feel like you're in the country because it's real quiet and the only time you'll hear uh, any noise is usually when the roosters are crowing or a hen laid an egg or something like that. We live in an old peach orchard plantation. We have horses, chickens, cats, dogs. We have a creek in the back, and I love it here. You couldn't pay me to live in the city. My husband's family is pretty much the dominant resident on this road. Our family, as far back as I can remember, has been Southern Baptist. We stick with our religion. Being a stay-at-home mom, it's a nonstop job. You don't get paid for it, but it's well worth the time. I couldn't ask for more. I told my husband Douglas that I was not gonna have no more children after age 30, because I wanted to be able to enjoy my children. But apparently God had other plans. I had Olivia at the age 30. I had no trouble with the pregnancy. She was like a perfect pregnancy. But when she came out, she came out with a bang because she was here in 13 minutes. Olivia has always been very motherly. She takes care of the other children. Out of all my sisters, I'm closest to Olivia. She likes to help when nobody's asking her. And if she can't do it, she'll do it anyways. Her teachers even told me Olivia was so motherly. I mean, she would run to the child, if they fall or get hurt, and she would try to help them up, or she'd run to the teacher and she'd say, such and such just got hurt, we need to take care of them. I see her trying to take care of me. I can be crying, she'll come up to me and pat me on the back and hug me, and she'll tell me, it's okay, mama. Even though she was motherly, she's still a mama's girl, no matter what. I mean, she wouldn't cling to nobody else. There was this tight bond. She didn't want to stay with nobody else. Like if I go to town or something, she would run and get in the car before I could. When Olivia hears keys rattling or mama, she hears her pick up her pocketbook. She flips out, she starts screaming and she starts running towards the door. She runs through the car and tries to get in. It's really extreme as far as I've seen. I think Olivia thinks Mama's never going to come back for her. None of my other children ever did anything like that. It's very hard for me to see her or hear her pitching a fit to go with me. I feel like I'm abandoning my daughter. But I'm not. I'm just going to the store to get some food so I can feed her or, you know, get gas or something. It's, it's just not easy. As Olivia got older, the fear of abandonment escalated. I felt like I was at a dead end road. I didn't know where I was going, what I was doing. How was I gonna help my youngin get past this? I soon recognized there was more going on with my daughter than I had realized. My five-year-old daughter, she's normally a mature child. But whenever I try to leave, she would go hysterical. It made me sad, but that was only the beginning. One day, my husband brought home a guitar from where he worked, and Olivia just picked it up and just started playing. Olivia has never, ever played a guitar before in her life. Never. I was surprised she even knew how to hold a guitar. She's never played one before. She adjusts the knobs and she just started singing maturely and the song she was singing wasn't like old McDonald or B-I-N-G-O. She knew what she was singing. She was in rhythm with the guitar and I've never actually seen her sing before. But when she did it, it was like she was a natural. And I looked at her and I said, Where'd you learn how to sing like that? She said, Mama, I used to be a singer. I used to live in California, then I moved to New York. I had a family before I got, came to y'all. And I said, who was in your family? She said, I lived with Indians. I said, was you an Indian? She said, no, I was a white girl. 
she's got quite an imagination. A little more advanced than a typical five-year-old. I asked Olivia, I said, well, how did you get from place to place? Did you drive a car, ride a motorcycle, airplane? She said, no, mama. We had wagons and we had horses. That's how we got around. It blew my mind. She has only been on this earth for five years. How would she know anything about the 18, 1700s? I know I never taught it to her. First, it was cute when she was telling us about wagons in California, but then it started taking a dark turn. She told me her family got killed. My three-year-old son, August, told me that he chose me to be his mother before he was born. Not too long after he told me about how he chose me and slid down on a string into me, it was another night. This was when I was putting him to bed. He looks over at me and says, you know, you weren't always my mother. I had another family before you, and you weren't with me. I thought that was uh, kind of strange. He said that my family sent us out. We had to go. I remember him saying over and over again, we had to go, we had to go out into the forest. And I just listened to him, and he said, in the forest, we had to look for and I had to get my animal. When he'd start looking back and forth as if he was walking back and forth or pacing. It seemed like he was acting it out a little bit right in front of me. I was concerned that it could have been frightening for him. I remember him saying, I was a boy. He said, I wasn't a man. August told her that he went out into the woods and they had a specific task that they had to complete, that all boys had to go through. There was danger involved. There was skill that you had to use in order to complete your task. And he went out and did it. That would be a rites of passage. We knew that we'd never talked about a rites of passage, a quest or something going out into the jungle, into the wild, and completing a task. We didn't have that conversation. And as far as I knew, he didn't see things like that on TV and definitely not in the movies because we were at every movie they had gone to at that point. So it was just something that did come from, from nowhere. When he was about four and a half, one evening, um, just before bed again, um, he jumps up on top of the bed and says, this is the dance that we used to do. And he jumped forward and back, step forward and then step back. I think it just came upon him sometimes. And then that was it. It just like blew through him and he would stop. August loved to collect things, whether it's at the beach, he would pick up rocks, whether it was in the park, he'd pick up a little piece of glass, um, string, anything, whatever he thought had some sort of significance. We had to spend a lot of time waiting for August who had to inspect everything. He would test out sticks. We'd have to go deeper into the park. He didn't really want to just stay in the meadow. He wanted to walk and stomp on stuff. And, <laughs> and then he would pick up these sticks and he'd drag them back with him. And he was displaying this sort of hunter-gatherer kind of uh, uh, behavior. And we would always have to dump out his pa pockets every night. It's like, you know, with the sticks and the feathers and the stones, and they were important to him. In the beginning, they seemed like just the kids rambling, just to, I'm picking up stuff. But it, it was consistent, and it was consistently the same things. I didn't know what was going on. I wasn't so concerned until he had to have a knife. My son August remembers choosing me to be his mother and he remembers saying that he had another family and that he had to go out into the forest to find his animal.
first he collected all the sticks and that was fine. It was like, okay, fine, you can collect the sticks. But then it, there was another level to it after a while. He says, well, I need to sharpen them. He kept going on and on and he says, I used to have knives. He says, I know how to use a knife. We don't own guns. We don't own knives. We don't go hunting on the weekend. We'd say, you know, August, you're too young. What are you going to do with a knife? What are you going to do with it now? You're just going to be able to look at it because we're not going to let you use it. And he says, no, I, I, I won't use it. I'll just hold on to it. I just want to look at it. You know, he'd try every angle he could just to get the knife. So we said, OK, well, if you're just going to get it and to just to look at it, it's decorative, then we'll just get you some little knives. OK, we'll get it only if. Only if you never take it out, you never show it to anybody. We keep it where you can't get access to it all the time. So we got him several little knives, all different kinds. And he would look at it, be excited about it. And I felt that he was appreciating the workmanship. After about the fourth or fifth knife, he came home from school and he said, Mom, I really want to go out in the yard and sharpen one of my sticks. We'd never let him do that before. Maybe if I let him do it one time, he'll get it out of his system and he'll leave me alone. He won't ask me anymore. So I said, OK, you have to go outside and I have to stand right next to you and I'll see how it's going. And then we'll stop and you'll come inside and have a snack. So he said, OK. And we go outside, and I sit down with him, and he just stripped the whole thing down to a point in like no time. So then he just looks at me. I'm not bleeding, I'm fine, and I know how to use these knives. But he was only like six. I was surprised that he even knew what to do with it. And I was impressed as well that he knew that this was a tool and not a weapon. He was very proud of himself. And he held onto that stick for a long, long time. Some of the things he told me might point to a vision quest, the way I understood it. So I started to do a little research about that, because you know, I, I didn't know anything about native rituals and what were some of the things that boys or men did. And I did find some records of some tribes on the border between Panama and Costa Rica that had what I felt was some similarities to the story that August was telling something that, that was a, a, a bit more mystical than just a ritual. I kept thinking of this thing very logically, but I still had a lot of questions. Just before his eighth birthday, we were out in Long Island at a small beach, and he was playing with his brother. It was a bay beach, so there were lots of shells and lots of different kinds of polished stones. He picks this one stone out, and he runs over to me, holds it up, and says, this is an arrowhead. I look at it. It looked like a rock to me. <laughs> and I said, really? And he says, no, this is an arrowhead. He was positive. So we all gather around him, and everybody's looking down at this stone. He turns it over, and he says, something's wrong with it. This is not the kind that I used to use. This one's different. I didn't know what was going on. My five-year-old daughter was very different from my other children. She had an attachment to me that I did not feel was normal. But at the same time, she had a maternal side of her beyond her years. And what was more surprising is when she started singing and playing a guitar, is she's never, ever had a lesson. That's when I became worried. She said, I have brothers and sisters. They got killed, and me and my sister, we live with the Indians. I said, well, were the Indians nice? She said, some were nice and some were mean. Which ones did you live with mostly? She said the nice ones. She said, I didn't like the mean ones. They're the one that killed my family. When she told me her family was killed, I was like, your family's here. We didn't die. Was this a dream or it's real? She looked like she had a burden on her shoulder. And she looked down, and then she looked back up at me. Real sad light, her face got real long. It was like a replay in her mind, I reckon. It made her sad. Me and Olivia, we were like really close. And she let me play with her hair, rub her face. You know, 
stroke her little nose. But when I get to her chin, she would draw back, like, don't touch my chin. I have never seen my daughter like this, never. She was always, you know, smiling, happy. But now she was starting to get more emotional. And it made me feel emotional for her. I do remember asking her, I said, did you have any children? She said, yes, I had a bunch of them. How many did you have? She said, mama, it would go from 13 to 100. I said, how is that? She said, I cared for all the children. So I'm assuming she helped take care of the children in the tribe. But then I asked her, I said, specifically, how many did you have? I had three. She said, I had two Indian boys, but I couldn't take them with me. But I had a little girl. I would have never believed it or had any interest in trying to learn anything about it until I realized that my daughter she knows too much for a five-year-old. But then again, I had another thought in my head, is this actually happening? Was my daughter a part of a reincarnated life? Reincarnation is something me and my husband never talked about because we wasn't brought up around it. Growing up Baptist, you have one life, and when you pass, you either go to heaven or you go to Hades. But our daughter is trying to tell us something, and we need to help her with it. I called my friend that is very familiar because she is a member of an Indian tribe. They do believe in reincarnation. And she was explaining to me how I could help Olivia. She told me how important it was to help her identify who she was and to get past the trauma of her past life so she could move on and enjoy this life. It started seeming more real. More and more, the puzzles were putting to, being put together. It was important for me to do the research because I wanted to help my daughter. But the more research I did, the more frightened I got. And what I learned about brought tears to my eyes. My son August was obsessed with knives and had the skills to use them, even though he hadn't been taught. He believed he had found an arrowhead, and I had no idea what to make of that. He turns it over in his palm of his hands, and he says, something's wrong with it. This is not the kind that I used to use. This one's different. And I said, well, what, what's different about it? And he didn't even say a word. He gets a piece of paper, and he draws me a little sketch. He says, this is the kind that I used to use. His arrowhead had more of a notch at the bottom. He said to me that night, we have to go to the museum. I want to ask them about this arrowhead. So I said, OK, fine, we'll do that. When we get back to New York, we get back to the city. But every single day, he would sit and stare at the stone every night. He's staring at it, he's feeling it, he's turning it over and over, he's talking about it. He says, I know what this is. I, I need to know who used to use it. Where did it come from? And who was around here? I had no idea. I had no concept of, of the indigenous groups out in Long Island. And still, I was a little skeptical, and I actually was wondering how he would feel if they said it wasn't an arrowhead, that it was just a rock then I didn't want him to be brokenhearted about it. So I was like, OK, we're going to have to go through this. So I took him one day after school. I walk up to the librarian. I said, is there anyone here who could look at this rock that my son found and perhaps tell us something about it? He takes it out of his pocket and he hands it to the men. And he takes it over to a desk and he looks at it. And we're all wondering what, what he's going to say. August was right. This really is an arrowhead. Looking back on many things that happened, I know that there's no mistaking what he said to me. This was the physical proof for him, and also a way to bring it full circle, that it wasn't just his imagination, that he was just dreaming or making up a story. He's a little boy from Brooklyn, and he was also an Indian boy. 
Now that I've got this piece of information, there's no doubt in my mind that he lived another life. One day, my five-year-old daughter came to me and told me her family was killed. She said it like she was recalling a memory. A friend of mine brought it to my attention that my daughter was talking about a past life, and it stopped me in my tracks. It woke me up. Olivia had a lot more to tell me, but her family being massacred was just the beginning. And Olivia had told me that her sister was in her arms and she died. And she was telling her, stay with me, stay with me. And she didn't stay with her. My name is Olivia and I'm five years old. Well, yeah, I got a bunch of sisters. but of them died, but I have one left by the end. It's just heartbreaking to know that my daughter remembered that my daughter remember that her sister passed away in her arms. It was so detailed and it is very emotional. At first I didn't know how to help her, but the more research I did, I didn't have nothing to lose. I just wanted to help her. I was trying to find the pioneer teenager that was taken by Indians. I looked at like over 60 females and the only pioneer female I could find that match all the details that she had given me was Olive Oatman. I was able to find this book about Olive Oatman's life. In 1851, Olive Oatman and her family was of a Mormon religion. They joined the wagon train and headed out west towards California. And they came to a river and they decided they were gonna settle there for the night. And a group of Indians came up, they raided their wagon and killed Olive's family, except for her and her little sister, Mary Ann. She told me her sister's name was Mary Ann and that didn't match. They took Olive and Mary Ann to their tribe. They tortured them, mimicked them, spat on them, and treated them like slaves. That's exactly how Olivia said it. She said they were very hateful and very mean to her. I mean, I just couldn't believe all the stuff that Olivia had told me was pretty much the same thing. When I read about Olive Oatman's family being killed, I realized that was the part where Olivia's having the abandonment issue. It made me angry, but that was the past. Now that's the, what I'm dealing with is I'm trying to help my daughter with her past to move forward. After a year, Olive and her sister Marianne were traded to a group of Indians called the Mojave Indians, which they were very nice and treated them with love and care. Olivia did say she lived with some good Indians as well, and that did match. The Mojave Indians gave Olive and her sister, Mary Ann, a tattoo on their chins. That's their sign of representing that they are a part of their tribe, they're a part of their group. It made the complete connection why Olivia is very sensitive. She does not like nobody touching her chin because she will literally draw back. The more and more I did on the research of Olive Oatman, I was excited. I wanted to know more. I just, it was like I was feeding off of it. I wanted to know more, I wanted to know more, but I have never been more afraid. My son August believed he had found an arrowhead, and I had no idea what to make of that. We went to the museum, and he hands the arrowhead to the men. And he says, you're right, young man, this is an arrowhead. In this case, I was happy to be proved wrong because it just confirmed all of the stories that he had been telling me for years. 
August was very, very proud of the fact that he recognized something that no one else could recognize, and it was because it was something that he used to use, something that he used to make. So he kept that arrowhead, which he still has to this day, in a little pouch on his bed. He never goes to sleep without it. He checks to make sure it's there every night. I'm August, I'm 17, and I just finished my senior year of high school. Getting the arrowhead authenticated was one of the last moments of me remembering past memories. And in a way, I feel the arrowhead really represented my memories. My mother's mother, I found out very late in life, was adopted. I felt that there was so much I didn't know about my grandmother. So I, I did some research and went into this whole genealogical thing. I discovered that grandma, my grandmother, um, was part of a tribe in uh, either Costa Rica or Panama. I think it's very interesting that my family is connected to a Central America tribe. I'm not sure if that directly correlates to my personal experience. Maybe it does. I think the context of the research that I was doing, that I was presenting to him, he wasn't sure if this was what he lived or if it was this particular group or not. It's just an area of mystery. Through my mom accepting my past experiences, it allowed me to accept it in a way because I knew I wasn't alone. And I guess that made me feel safe, that it was okay to say these types of things. It was just a feeling of acceptance. My mother used to say to me all the time, she said, there are no mistakes and there are no coincidences. And when I was younger, I didn't think that that was true. But looking back on many things that happened and, and the stories that August have told me, I know that there's no mistaking what he said to me and what it should mean to me. I've discovered that August has transferred his tribal mentality to baseball. And he brings that same warrior type mentality to his teammates. August is absolutely still the warrior. I use tribe and family interchangeably. We're a family and we always have each other's backs. The way that I understand it, I think he's, he's now invested in this life. So he doesn't need to remember that anymore. I think he's brought from the past with him the positive aspects of whatever he lived before and I feel that he's moving upward with beauty and grace, and uh, I couldn't be more proud of him. My future is another life. Um, there's pain, there's beauty, and through all of it, it's still life. I've always been confused about time, especially when I was younger. It seemed like just a few blinks and everything can be over. Life has already passed by. And it's what you do in between the blinks that really defines you. And remembering that maybe there is another chance for another life really makes me wanna do the best I can now and just the main thing is just love, I guess. My five-year-old daughter, she said, Mama, I used to be a singer. I used to live in California. Then I moved to New York. I had a family before I got, came to y'all. But then it started taking a dark turn. She told me her family got killed. When Olivia kept telling me she used to be a singer, I didn't really understand it until I read the book about Olive Oatman's life, where her and her sister, Marianne, would sing for the Mojave Indians. They would sing hymns and stuff, and the Mojave Indians gave them beads and stuff as rewards or as thank yous. And they indulged in it, they loved it. And then it just made sense when my daughter said, Mom, I used to be a singer. Another thing that matched up, get further on into the book, 
It did speak where Olive did take care of all the children in the tribe, where Olivia kept telling me she had 2013 to 100 kids she'd take care of. And it was blowing my mind, but we got further into the book, it made sense. She did take care of all these other children in the tribe. Five years after Olive Oatman was captured, the army had got word that there was a white woman living with the Indians, and they met up with the Indian chief and negotiated to get her back. I asked Olivia, did she want to leave the tri tribe? She said no, but she had no choice. When the army made the trade, Olive Oatman moved to New York. Like Olivia says, she lived in California and moved to New York. It did scare me. I mean, because it was so true. I mean, it was like a five-year-old story becoming reality. I can't say I'm 100% certain that my daughter Olivia is Olive Oatman, but everything is fitting in like a piece of puzzle. The research was a little aggravating, but I eventually found track of where I needed to be, and I wanted to go more in depth of what I was looking for. And it all added up, especially when I got to looking and I thought, well, let's see if this Olive Oatman looks anything like my daughter. When I showed her the first picture of Olive Oatman ever, I filmed it. I wanted to see her expression. I did shed some tears because she was looking. I said, Olivia, does this woman look familiar to you? Does this lady look familiar to you? Face look like me. Her face look like you? Mm-hmm. See that and that? I looked at her. I said, does she? She said, Mama, she's got my face. When you look at her, their bone structures are almost the same. I think that's when it dawned on Olivia. I think we found her match. I feel like I'm better equipped to helping her now that we've made that connection. Olive Oatman had many different names that the Indians called her. Some was not very nice, but the one that Olivia remembers, they called her Leaf Feather. That's the name she remembers, Leaf Feather. In order to help Olivia, I would like to memorialize Olive Oatman's life by throwing some feathers into the creek and releasing this torment of memories so she can move forward in this life. The feathers would represent Olivia's life with the Indians. Olivia has memories of losing two families in this lifetime at the age of five. The Oatman family and the Indian family that she became a member of but I want her to realize in this life, nobody's gonna take her family away from her. We are here, we are there, and we are very close to her, and we love her very much, and we want her to realize the tragedy is over. The heartbreak is over. Enjoy what you have now. And I'm hoping that she will be able to separate herself from her past life in this life so she'll know it's okay to be away from me as her mother, and then she could just be, Olivia, just be a regular child, enjoy her childhood. She ain't gotta worry about all the torment and all the responsibilities she had to deal with back then. Well, Olive Oatman having such a great spirit to persevere, and I know my daughter, I know she'll have the same great spirit as well. And I am very excited for her future. Separation anxiety disorder can be pretty severe. I mean, it can get to the point where it could cause a heart attack. So yes, she needs to be treated. 
she's doing real good. Everything's out on the open, out on the table. Everybody understands where she's coming from, what she's experiencing. And now I feel that we are secure and that we're gonna be on the right track. It's a slow process each time. I can extend my time away from her where I can actually be able to be gone like a normal mother would be to go grocery shopping and her know that I will be back. I'm looking forward for Olivia having closure in the, her past life so she can be the Olivia that I'm supposed to have in this life.